it's really my pleasure to welcome everyone to this uh, panel with uh, our guest uh, and uh, which uh, our guest, which you will hear more about soon. Um, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Shreya Sundaram, who is going to be the panel moderator. I think all of us or many of us know Shreyas, but uh, Professor Sundaram is actually an associate professor in the School of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering. And he's also the co-director of the uh, ICON Center. Um, and uh, we're very thankful for uh, him taking the leadership in this panel. So uh, Shreyas, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks very much, Dimitri. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. And hopefully you can all see that. Yes. Perfect. OK, excellent. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have everyone here for the second uh, event of uh, Professor Claire Tomlin's uh, Engineering Distinguished Lecture. Uh, it, it's, uh, she gave her, her seminar at 1 o'clock, and um, it was a wonderful overview of uh, the problem of safe learning and robotics. Um, so just to continue on that theme here, obviously, you know, robotic systems play an increasingly large role in society in a variety of life critical applications. So things like surgical robotics, um, manufacturing, construction, you know, autonomous vehicles. Um, and the, these robots that are interacting with the physical world in various ways and that we're uh, implementing controllers for learning algorithms uh, the potential for things going wrong and impacting life and property in negative ways uh, is, is really large. And so it's really critical that we try and understand how to design these systems to be, to be safe and secure. Um, so the robotic systems inherently because of their interaction with the physical world are different from you know, traditional IT systems, right? Where a uh, computer system where, where things go wrong may cause the system to shut down unless it's controlling something that interacts with the physical world. Um, and so there are a variety of interesting challenges that come into play here. Um, and so these system designers that, that put together these robots have to make sure that the learning algorithms and the controllers uh, do what they're supposed to do, even in the face of failures or attacks, um, and are careful to make sure that, that things don't go wrong. So this is a, 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 a major challenge. And, and today, uh, we have four uh, distinguished panelists here uh, who are experts in this general area uh, to provide their perspectives and to, um, to have a vigorous discussion, hopefully, uh, about the challenges um, and the capabilities that, that arise. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce these panelists. So we'll start the panel by having each of the panelists uh, give a very short overview of some of the work that they're doing, their perspectives. Um, after that, we'll go into a discussion um, uh, where I will ask questions and, and the panelists can, can answer and the audience can also chime in with questions. And one thing to note is that the uh, audience does not have to wait until the question period at the end to start asking questions. You can go ahead and enter your questions in the chat box and that way we will be able to ask them as they come up. Great, so it's my pleasure to start with uh, Professor Claire Tomlin, who is the Charles Desor Chair in the College of Engineering and a Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Berkeley. And uh, she's been at, at Berkeley for some time, but she started her career at Stanford um, and she's made significant contributions to control theory, uh, hybrid systems, switch systems, uh, air traffic control, and so forth. She's a uh, MacArthur Fellow, an IEEE Fellow, uh, Donald Ekman uh, Award winner, and one of the few people uh, to be both a NAE Fellow and an American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, Fellow. So it's a great pleasure to have you, Professor Tomlin. Um, so you already gave us a very nice overview of your work uh, in your lecture, uh, but here in the context of this panel, um, we'd like to have you talk a little bit about um, the safety uh, issues or the issues relevant to this panel. Um, and so I'm gonna uh, give you um, access to the screen here via a remote control. And so now your the screen is yours. Oh, this is a format I'm not used to. So I Yep, yeah, so if you were to... No, I, okay, so uh, I'm... So it should have given you access. So it says waiting for you to control. Every time I try to control it, it mutes me. What's going on here? Where it says viewing options and you should be able to re request remote control right up by your name, right at the top view options. Um, 
or I, I'm happy to advance the slides for you if that's preferable. I don't see the option in those three dots, you mean? It doesn't seem I have an option to request remote control. Although it does say I can control your um, screen. Yeah, so you, that you are controlling now. Yeah, so if you, hit, if you hit the right button, you should see it advance or the right okay. arrow. Let me just try this because that's really cool and I didn't know you could do this on Zoom. So I'm just gonna try see what I'm doing wrong. It says I'm controlling your screen and then I'm trying to advance and it's not advancing. Uh, let me see, what do I need to do? Um, it, it, it did it I do that, that? Yeah. or did you do that? I think, uh, try it again. Strange, okay. Well, I'm happy to advance for you. You can just tell me next slide. Okay, I, that's way cool though. I didn't know you could do that on Zoom. Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for, first of all, thanks for organizing such a wonderful visit. And um, even though it's virtual, just having the, the way that you've organized it with the lecture, but then the discussions and then this panel, I really appreciate it and um, really uh, am enjoying my day. Um, so I'd like to, um, maybe as a springboard from what I was talking about um, earlier today, uh, present this kind of uh, a viewpoint. So it's not a, um, it, it's how I've been thinking about safety, uh, autonomous systems and safety, safety of those autonomous systems. So if you could, um, and this is joint work with several students, but also with Alexandra Faust at um, Google and Jitendra Malik, who works in computer vision at Berkeley. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, please, Shreyas. Okay. So this is, the, this is a, a, a very simple problem or seemingly simple problem. You have an autonomous system. You'd like to navigate it from where it is now to a goal. And um, it just doesn't know. It, it knows where it is. It knows where the goal is, but it, it doesn't know what's, what's in between. And um, it has a camera and we're going to design a perception system for this uh, robot to be able to perceive the environment and act on both what it's seeing as well as its knowledge that it wants to get to the goal. Um, so the environment is unknown. It's not really unknown because um, the, uh, the, the knowledge of the environment or the knowledge of what to do comes through in the training of the perception module. So we proposed, um, and if we advance to the next slide, uh, Shreyas, a, um, an architecture where there are, um, three modules, a perception module, a, um, which takes in images and gives um, a next waypoint for the vehicle to follow in its path from where it is to where it wants to go. That feeds into a very standard, we just used a spline-based spline planning module, then that feeds into a very standard, we just used a linear quadratic regulator for the control. Um, our, our, our kind of uh, maybe thoughts coming into this are that the planning and control, once you have an idea of what your environment looks like, they are solved problems. We have wonderful algorithms to do that. Let's use the models that we have of what we have and let's integrate them kind of in a sensible way with, um, with learning where you need it. And in this case, that's in, um, in, in perceiving and uh, understanding the environment so that you can act on that. Um, so this architecture was, it's also taking advantage of, you know, the recent, um, I would say decade of work in computer vision that is, has developed. Um, in this case, we used a convolutional neural net um, and we trained that neural net fully in simulation. So simulated data of indoor texture meshes. Um, we trained it using a loss function, which was developed from optimal control. And that's how um, it has learned to give us the next waypoint. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and can you play this, Shreyas? Okay, so um, the first person view is what the robot's seeing. And then the third person view is, is, what, uh, is what you can see. And then you see a top down kind of view. Here, the goal is outside that room and it's in the hallway. It was never trained on doors or, I mean, it was trained on data with doors, but it was never told about the semantics of a door or the need to go through a door to get to a hallway. It comes out, it's on a floor, there's, there's glare of light, right, right where the goal is. And it transferred from, you know, carpeted room to glare, a, a kind of glare. It's with the, the data that we provided, it's learned to, you know, do those 
things like go through a door to get outside of the room to go to a goal. And it's, um, it's become, and we've, we've got some, you know, more um, robust statistics on this. It's become more robust to um, glare or, you know, little faults with the camera, for example, than if we use the traditional slam pipeline where we build a map and then use planning and control on that. Um, it's also more robust than an end-to-end -end framework. So this was a stepping stone where we said, okay, so we want, if we want to preserve a, a kind of modular architecture where we use learning where we need it, this is possible. So if we go to um, the next slide, please. And this is really where I want to just sort of put questions for the panel. So now if we think, and I, again, this is a limited example, but you know, um, maybe relevant for autonomous vehicles that are going through um, environments that are unknown. Although what we've shown in experiment is, is a far cry from kind of our general autonomous car, right? But the, some challenges now to think about. Um, the first, um, we are relying on that perception module to give us the next waypoint. Um, that is, uh, you know, we, we haven't done any analysis or any bounding or um, any, um, you know, uh, th that module could fail. And, and where does it fail? It fails when it gets images that are things that it hasn't seen before or that weren't in the training distribution. So one question we've been working on is, can we monitor the images as they're coming in real time and ask, are they within the training distribution? Or are they outside the training distribution? That's a very hard question generally because you don't typically have distributions for your training distribution, uh, for your, um, you don't have distributions for your training data. Um, related question is, okay, can we also, um, find some way to characterize the uncertainty in the output of the learning module. So that's that waypoint. That's actually something that we're working on. And this is, you know, there are what people working on neural nets have done quite a bit of work in dropout or training with ensembles to try to characterize, you know, this is the waypoint you're getting, but kind of, you know, any waypoint in this region would be probably pretty good, or that's the kind of data we'd like to see, but how do we do that in, um, you know, how do we do it practically, but also in a scientifically principled way? How should this uncertainty be then propagated through the planning and decision-making loop um, is a question that, that I think is a very important question now. And then of course, this is a very simple question. What about more complex models, environments? Um, you know, typically you don't have such a good model of your vehicle. So there's, there's things in there you might want to learn as well. So learning parts of the dynamics, but what about more complex environments, people moving around? So these are all questions and challenges that I think um, really set a research agenda for the future in this, in this area or part of a research agenda. And, uh, and, and that's, the, uh, that's the end of my short presentation. Perfect, thank you, Claire. Um, so we'll do an introduction by everybody, and then we'll come back to these discussions, these, these questions. Um, all right, so our, our next panelist is Professor Xinyan Deng, who is an associate professor here at Purdue in mechanical engineering. We have a Berkeley heavy panel today. Uh, so Professor Deng also got her PhD uh, at the University of Berkeley, and she's been at Purdue um, uh, as a faculty member since. Um, she's received the NSF Career Award in 2006. She was selected as a uh, BFS a a Schaefer Outstanding Faculty Scholar in 2015. Uh, she works uh, broadly in the space of robotics, particularly bio-inspired robotics, aerial robotics, and so forth. Um, and so today she's gonna tell us a little bit about her perspectives on uh, robotics and, and safety. Uh, so Shinyan, let's see if we can try the control again. Are you able to take control? Okay. Hmm. I was successful using the arrow keys, but now they are not working somehow. Ah, it did work in the practice. So this yeah. is how it always goes, isn't it? There we go. Yeah, now I think oh, you're doing works? it. Yeah. Okay, so it's me that's controlling. Okay. Okay, so I've been thinking uh, what kind of work in my lab, which is uh, related to uh, security controls and also learning. So I'm going to show you those aspects in my lab that's relating to this. 
So this is one of the project, it's an OR project, which um, I have two computer science professors as collaborators. We are looking at cyber physical securities. So cyber physical attacks. So traditionally in computer science, you know, you're attacking the hackers can hack your computer, hack your, you know, you have to strengthen the memory or firmware. But if you have a mobile robot, and if the hackers can hack you in real time to manipulate your control software, to try to spoof in your sensor, actuator, you know, operating system, uh, what do you do? So this is uh, basically a uh, four year and they extended just, you know, one more year until like uh, this summer. So it's been a previous few years of work in this aspect. And the, basically, if we look at the way it's structured, traditional cyber centric approach and also control centric approach, um, there's a gap between, and we were trying to bridge the gap and using the computer science expertise in reverse engineering some of the code and trying to extract some of the uh, hidden attacks probably there. And also using control or dynamics um, expert, uh, expertise here to put it in uh, not exactly the fault tolerant control, but it's a control framework that you can retrofit the system using minimum amount of extra hardware and software so that you can detect some errors and try to recover the flight. So basically this project, the key is retrofitting. So the OR basically saying, oh, not all the, you know, not everything is brand new with the latest uh, software and hardware, but what if you have an existing system, you can just retrofit it with some added pro property of defend against hackers. So this is what we did. We use, um, you know, rovers and also drones as examples to retrofit them. So basically you have a kind of a redundant controller where you can take some sensor reading and then compare it with what you estimated as the system dynamics and try to compare it with the real vehicle, what's happening there. And then we can try to do uh, detection and recovery. So the details are in the papers we have, but I will just show you a very quick, um, you know, maybe just starting of the videos. So some sensor attacks, meaning that if your IMU gets spoofed and your reading may be several degrees off and without the so-called blue box, which is the um, retrofitted uh, unit, you will fail, but with the blue box and you can have your um, retrofitted unit to take over tem temporarily at least. Or if it's too severe, you just have it safely landing. And actuator attacks, for example, they lock one of the motor maybe beyond certain height. And these are all malicious um, code that can embed in the system when it's coming out of the factory. So, and also operating system uh, attacks. So, so basically they can just uh, totally wipe off the com computer, I mean, controller for some certain time. So this is the security related work and we can come back later to it. So just one more minute to Xinyang, just then just a time gap down. Yeah, yes, yes. So learning based control in our lab is basically, we want to use reinforcement learning. Actually, we did use reinforcement learning to try to use this hummingbird robot to mimic some aggressive maneuvers in animals. So for example, this is to mimic a flip, 360 degree flip. And then the next one is to mimic um, hummingbird escape from a threat. So let me go to the next slide. And what I want to point out is, so if you have a looming threat in the front, hummingbird will, will escape to a certain pattern and try to minimize the time of escaping. And if we use reinforcement learning to train this robot, what happens is that they will give you a very similar pattern of the body kinematics and wing kinematics too. It's very interesting. So the trajectory is learned and you just give it a reward function and of course, um, set it up in the reinforcement learning. So basically what, what I want to try to say is a real animal has this type of uh, wing, uh, body kinematics and what you, what you train from the robot, it's very, very similar. They do a kind of a banked turn. They do a like pitching up and roll and they escape. That's the you know, quickest way to escape. And the storyline here is an experiment result. And let's go to the next one. And another thing I want to show is that talking about safety of robot. If you think about this bio-inspired robot, because the wings are soft and it's um, undulatory motion, they don't, they don't get tangled. And you can just, you know, they're safe to the touch. And when they 
when we send, send it to, you know, from A to B, like, a, you know, just a point point tracking, although there are some obstacles in between, it can just bump through because the wings are soft, the body has some, have, have some yield because of springs and it's quite robust. And this is just one which we have a, a multimodal thing. So you can just go through some narrow um, space and then you can stand up and fly. So I've always been a very, uh, you know, advocate for by uh, inspiration because these things are very resilient. That's the really resiliency and uh, the safety sometimes associated with it. Um, they make them very attractive. I think I have only last slide left. Yeah, this is just so, just show you some, some you know, uh, we look at some um, additional uh, locomotion principles because, for example, this is a recent work we are looking at. Well, we, we found out that flapping flight naturally reject gusts, reject disturbances because dragonflies and hummingbirds, they migrate thousands of miles each, you know, each year. And they, to save energy, they don't need to fight with the gusts all the time. The turbulence, they, the, somehow the flapping flight itself get attenuated uh, for the turbulence. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about. So I just want to uh, maybe just, um, trigger some thoughts. That's, yeah, that's a work we do related to this type of uh, aspect. Well, thank you. Uh, so our next uh, speaker is Professor Insuk Wong, who is a professor here in aeronautics and astronautics at Purdue. Uh, professor Wong got his PhD at Stanford with uh, Professor Tomlin and has been at Purdue. Um, and he has uh, uh, received the NSF Career Award in 2008, was selected as one of the nation's brightest young engineers by the NAE in 2008 as well. He received the AIAA Special Service Citation in 2010. He's an Associate Fellow of the AIAA. So Professor Wong, I will give you control. Uh, thank you. Um, let me see, I can control. Yes. Oh, okay. So uh, I have only one slide like this. So uh, I wouldn't go over five minutes a line, a sign. And the, uh, this is my uh, last work in a uh, very highlight the summary. As Claire presented when the architecture for this robotic exploration, our lab also has a two major component area. One is the uh, lower left right corner that the information inference for situational awareness that corresponding to uh, perception that we understand what's going on, the in, in environment as well as the robot itself, and then the system itself. And then once we understood what's going on, the next step is to take an action. And so the, uh, the problem is now boils down to that the, uh, can, how can we infer the intent in a way that it can be perceived by the robots and so, for example, that the robot is, everything is working properly, it can do certain amount of work, but it has a, some failed component, then its performance uh, the limited, and they can be computed using, for example, with superset computation, that the, the envelope is very large when system is uh, normal, but that can be distorted if system is abnormal. That abnormal, and then the understanding that from the multiple sensors, nowadays the sensors are, I mean, three of the sensors used even for small robots and drones, for example. Then how can it combine them together to get generate the uh, situational awareness? And then at the same time, the one application is the uh, robot could be autonomous, but many times human in the loop or human on the loop. So some way the robot interact with each other, uh, the, with human, then the, uh, the how human can collaborate this automation or machine in a safe way. And one good example of this system is the uh, airplane cockpit. And this small figure shows the modern day airplane, commercial airline cockpits. And pilot actually uh, control the vehicle, the aircraft, just like a computer game that you push a button and then turn the knobs and so on and so forth. So that the, uh, while automation is going on and pilot is doing something collaboratively together, but the, uh, there could be a misunderstanding between the two. I mean, recent the accidents in the uh, Boeing 737 uh, MAX incidents that uh, autopilot wants to do one thing, pilot misunderstood or wants the other things, then 
instead of collaborating between them and they fight each other. So pilot wants to go up, airplane wire wants to go down for some reason. Then the problem is that they, can we identify the pilots and the automations in pen and show it to the pilot or the other way around from the machine's perspective, machine can understand the pilot's intent. He wants to go up or go down or speed up and slow down. How can he do it? And this discrepancy is a well-known problem in the control community called um, mode confusion problem or automation surprise problem. So the situation awareness problem, one of the situation awareness problem is to understanding that can he capture this early enough so that the pilot or automation can take a uh, recovery measure or mitigation measure and resolve this uh, conflicting intent problems. And another issue is that the uh, automation assists the a human, but sometimes, I mean, many times in the human operator are experts, then they can do better than automation. And you know, we call them as experts. Then human does not need to support him or her. And sometimes it's just the bothering it. If they keep bothering the human, human tends to turn it off rather than getting assistance out of it. So that the, how can he make the, this collaboration in such a way that machine understood the skill level of a human operator so that it assists appropriately and the overall system safety, for example, can be maintained rather than human just ignore the, any advice from the automation, which could lead to a unsafe situation. And so uh, that can be done again using the uh, data-driven approach because modeling human is tremendously difficult. And while we have a lot of data coming from this uh, experiment. So that the, from this experimental data, we developed the human cognitive, human model, human model again, representing the skill level of the system, the human in this specific case, and minute. then designing controller. Okay. So uh, yeah, then that, that leads to a uh, control actions that the, how can he assist the human and, or the robots in such a way that collectively we achieve the better uh, safety. And the next slide I have actually one more slide. This is the, not my lab, but the, our AA department recently have established this huge indoor uh, UAS test facility and it could be the amended vehicles, any vehicle, not only flying vehicles. Uh, we have a Purdue has an airport and the, around the airport, we have a multiple aerospace infrastructures, you know, wind tunnels and the propulsion labs and so on. And one of the hangar, which is the about 20,000 square feet and 30 foot uh, feet ceiling, a huge structure we do have here represented in here. So uh, now we have a more capability for gathering a more data safely and efficiently, and also test and validate the developed algorithms and more safely and uh, securely. And so, and also it could be used for the, uh, and we envision that it would be used for educational purpose. And this is not, we develop, the AAE develop, proposed to develop uh, this facility, but we want to use this facility as a hub so that the, all these ICON faculty members, for example, come together here and do the project together, collaborative project together. So uh, that's what I have for today. Wonderful, thank you. And then our last panelist is Professor Shashay Mo, who is an assistant professor of aeronautics and astronautics here at Purdue. He's also the co-director of ICON. Um, professor Mo got his PhD at Yale uh, with Professor Stephen Morse, and then subsequently did a, a postdoc at MIT uh, before coming here uh, to Purdue. Um, so Shashay, I will give it to you, and um, I'll give you a warning at about the three-minute mark. Okay, sure. And uh, I could control screen now. Not, not work in my keyboard. Okay. Let's see. Yes. It it work. Okay. So today we're more like talk about uh, the safe and resilient autonomy, and uh, when we talk about the robots, I guess the most impressive one might be the humanoid robot from Boston Dynamics, which can be looking at as a single complex robot with a high degree of uh, intelligence. And on the other hand, there could be a swarm of simple robots which can work as a cohesive whole for some uh, complicated missions like exploring uh, a large area of the unknown 
And this swarm, uh, robotic swarm also has its own advantage of being robust, flexible, and uh, scalable. So we will talk about both. And we will we talk, we, when it comes to safety for ro robots, uh, Professor uh, Tommy has presented a very nice method for the uh, by using reachable sets for safety. But actually here we more want to attack this uh, uh, safety problem from another perspective, how to leverage human expertise to uh, help robot to solve the safety problem. For example, if a robot is already programmed or a robot is to be programmed, how should we use human expertise to help the robot to plan to, to generate a trajectory with uh, obstacle avoidance? And actually sparse human inputs do help a lot. The key idea here is to integrate human input into robust objective learning. And uh, the proposed framework here, we more like uh, look at a robot and uh, an autonomous system uh, under uh, driven by optimal control with a tunable parameter. And then when it comes to safety or additional constraints, we could introduce this additional loss function to evaluate the trajectory of the robots. And then we, we actually did utilize the, the uh, X and U and the output of the loss function and, and the feedback and design another optimal control system in the feedback loop to help tune the parameter. So this is our most recent paper presented by uh, at NIPS. And of course, this is not designed or not limited to only the human assisted uh, safety, uh, but here we could use that example to show you how UAV learn to avoid obstacles. Uh, Given one point, this UAV, the drone could pass these two doors and two way, two -way point is much better. Of course, you may argue that we, you could use the curve fitting and to help the, the robot, but if the obstacle moves and the curve fitting method does not uh, work. And here we more integrate the, uh, the humid way, sparse way point into the object learning of the robot. Another one when it comes to actually a robotic swarm and we were not only care about safety, but also resilient. By resilience means the system capability to prepare and plan for and absorb and recover from uh, the adverse events. The challenge here is that, you know, when it comes to robotic swarm, uh, each robot is usually with low cost, with limited sensing and processing capability. And also each robot can only communicate or coordinate with with a certain nearby neighbors. And on the other hand, the cyber attacks could be very sophisticated, could be fully controlled one agent, could be launched massively from multiple locations, and it could be also highly mobile. And we more like uh, have a uh, focus on how to achieve resilience into the uh, perhaps one of the most fundamental problem called multi-agent optimization for robotic swarms. So each agent here has a local objective, and has the state has some local constraints, and the goal here is to uh, for uh, to design a digital algorithm for all the robots to reach a consensus to minimize this global objective and with uh, uh, subject to the local constraints. So this fundamental problem could solve actually could be applied to uh, coordination of uh, multiple drones and also multi-agent reform learning. One minute left. So, okay, so we have. Uh, so with this one, resilience for digital consensus, and uh, this is collaboration with the uh, Shias, and we consider the time varying network, Byzantine attack, time varying locations, and also only local information available. And currently we are have ongoing uh, work as uh, for multi-agent reinforcement learning, as we have uh, a leading uh, Gilbert postdoc fellow, Yi Jing, co-supervised by uh, Shias and myself, and uh, this is still ongoing. As actually any problem related to safety and uh, uh, security in robotics or robotic swarm definitely are challenging and it requires uh, uh, different expertise and a collaboration of faculties from, uh, with different backgrounds. I think this motivates us to launch this uh, center for innovation control optimization and networks. And this center, currently we have 52 faculty members from eight department and Purdue. And we have established a bunch of uh, research scenes in the umbrella of robotics and robotic swarms. And um, this is uh, uh, my part. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I think that was a, a, a wonderful overview by the, the entire panel about the different perspectives and the different um, backgrounds that everybody's coming from. So with that, um, I'll stop.
uh, screen sharing and we'll enter the discussion phase of our of the panel. Um, so as I said uh, before, you can feel free to type in questions into the chat and we will uh, answer them as we go. Um, but perhaps to get us started, I'd like to start with a question that was related to what Professor Tomlin raised at the end of hers, which is sort of this idea of when we're doing learning, the, you know, uh, there's this notion of emergence, right? So essentially you'd like the system to be able to perhaps learn things in a way that maybe, you know, you can't predict a priori, otherwise you'd have just designed a controller for it, right? Um, but then there's a trade-off between sort of emergence, which is sort of unpredictably, unpredictable behavior, which does amazing things that you could not have predicted a priori and safety guarantees. Um, and so there seems to be an inherent tension between these two. Um, and I was wondering whether the panelists have any thoughts on how do you balance between giving it freedom to learn new things, but also providing guarantees on safety and security. Does anybody wanna, Professor Tomlin, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I, I mean, I do, um, but I'm not sure it's the right thing to do yet. I mean, what, what we've been doing, because we define safety in a fairly crisp way with respect to constraints, um, we have, uh, what, what we've been doing is exploring the boundaries of those constraints. So if you're, you know, mathematically, if you're operating on the boundary of one of our level sets and you don't stay on the boundary, you kind of go into the safe region, it means you were probably conservative because the, the control is such that, uh, you know, the best possible control, it should just keep you on the boundary. So that means that you were more conservative, so you could probably push your boundary out a little bit. Um, so rather than kind of starting with something very small and growing it, we start with a set that we know is, where we, we think it's, we, we've proven it's safe if we trust the models that we're using and the specification that we have. And then we explore on the boundaries of those. But that is um, it, like, it's, it of course came as is inspired mathematically by, you know, what's, but in real life, we want uh, problems where there's whole other regions of the state space away from the boundary that we'd like to be able to assess and explore. And I think like learning about like do, doing exploration in a safe way to gain information about the system and then having kind of limited real exploration is some vague notion that I'd like to pursue where um, perhaps the we use we try to use simulations very effectively, but of course you can only simulate what you can model. So. So I, I, I'd love to have this discussion and hear what the other panelists think as well. Yeah, Shinyan and Suk, Shashwe, any thoughts on this idea of how do you explore effectively while still providing guarantees on safety? Um, this is in Zuck. Uh, the I think this is an important problem yet is uh, two different uh, problems indeed. So uh, when I saw the uh, community the working on this related area and someone more focused on that the explorations are all done in the safe environments, sometimes the simulations, sometimes you know, the labs and so on. So the end results would be safe, then I'm okay, right? And the other one is that, what if this car is moving around while operating, it also learns. Then the just end results is okay, it's not okay because is supposed to learn on the fly too. So uh, these two are uh, related, but different problems or different perspective at least. And then the uh, exploration, then the on the go is, I would say, uh, I think at least that uh, it could be more conservative way, right? Be our search space exploration space is much limited because we want, we want each time we do not want to try too far away from the my current state, which could cause a, a you know, insafety. So uh, the, um, and the, from my perspective and one of the, my students also working on is that initially we get the uh, safe space and then, and this is done by batch manner. So we collect the data and then analyze the system and learn to models and learn 
control policies and so on and so forth. And, but certainly the old data we gathered may not necessarily be rich enough or complete, it shouldn't be complete, right? So the, we also allow the system learns on the run. Then the uh, staff size to improve or the change the parameters could be a much smaller and then check. And also the computational issues. One of the Q&A questions I saw is that the, how onboard sensor at the onboard computer has a computational capabilities. That is also very important. I'm using mostly small drones and it has very, very limited computational capabilities. So that's another issue from the other perspective of related. Uh, Shenyan or Shashui, any thoughts I on that? Add, I can only add maybe a couple of points on the application point of view. So when you apply reinforcement learning or learning algorithm to a robot, a real robot, for example, our robot, which is only, which won't have two actuators, you are controlling a full six degree freedom. And of course, the reason we want to try learning, you know, two reasons. One is that in those fancy maneuvers, like acrobatic maneuvers, the aerodynamics is so complicated. Dynamics itself is so complicated. So model-based control, no matter how good it is, sometimes will not give you a good result. So we use, we started with using reinforcement learning as a supplement to our conventional controls. And then we later found that actually in some cases it's even better. So sometimes we even, you know, replace it in certain cases. So another, for example, when you are doing a flip right upside down, your conventional control will try to stabilize the system. So sometimes it will be a contradict to your goal. So in that case, we have to shut it down and just use reinforcement learning. So for application for safety of the robot, of course we didn't crash. We didn't crash the robot so many. So for the safety, I think uh, when you are training in a computer, so we port from we go from simulation to the experiment, and usually we are pretty successful in a sense. For example, we do ten experiments. There will be like six successful case and actually two very good cases. And of course there will be failed cases. Say so, so if it doesn't do a nice tight flip. And it will fail, but it will diverge. But again, it will stabilize itself immediately because your conventional control will catch up at that moment to at least stabilize it and land it safely. So my, what I'm trying, my our experience is that when you train your algorithms, you have to randomize your dynamics. So put random, inject randomness in your dynamic param parameters, and take account into I mean take into account your sensor noise, your even communication delay. You're basically, in, whatever will happen in the real world, you need to try to take into counter, account in a simulator so that, you know, the more you train it, and uh, it will be more robust. Um, I mean, that's my own, my, my two cents in the application side. Shashwet, did you have any quick thoughts or should we? Yeah, a little bit. I think that the, this is the, there must be a, a, a trade-off curve between the system performance and also the safety concerns. And from our group, we more like uh, uh, to formulate our model the safety constraints and uh, and uh, a new objective function. And uh, you know, just giving a pre-designed uh, optimal control system. And then when there are the additional constraints, we add another layer or a feedback loop, feedback to the tuning parameter. So this is the way how we deal with the, the safety constraints here. Perfect. Uh, so we had a question in the in from the audience about the computational capabilities, which uh, Professor Wong alluded to, and um, I think this also pertained to something that Professor Talman talked about in her talk about computing these reachable sets online, right? Uh, coming up with fast approaches. Uh, so could the panel comment on the computing capabilities and requirements for these robots to achieve and implement these types of strategies in real time, often in these you know uh, resource limited uh, platforms? I mean, um, this is so big research direction for computing reachable sets. And I see there's another question in the chat about that. Like for multiple vehicles, if you have uh, reach avoid games, for example, with multiple players, the dimensions of the problem are increasing the more, um, the more players you have. And uh, the, the, pro the technologies that we've addressed uh, these problems with have been um, decomposition, if you can, uh, decompose the problem. We've had some success there. Um, 
uh, you know, you could impose some rules of the road. Uh, so some protocols to make sure that you've really only limited your tight interactions to groups of two or three agents. Um, and then this uh, uh, deep reach methodology, I think is quite promising that, that I presented where you're using a machine learning method to solve the, um, the PDE. But these are all very good. These are all still very um, hard computational problems and dimensionality is an issue. For doing the training of the neural net, so the, that training we do for perception, we do all of that offline. And, um, and then we port it and use the neural net that we've, we've uh, previously trained to use it in real time. So the training is all offline and typically requires, we've, um, we've either been using um, the, a, a GPU based server that we have um, in the lab or we, with our collaborations with Google, we can, um, we've got some Google cloud credits there, but yeah, those are, those are offline computations right now. Um, Shinyan, did you have any thoughts on the computational uh, requirements, for example, for your little hummingbirds? I presume if you were to fly those, it's going to be extremely computationally restricted. Um, any thoughts on applicability to those kinds of platforms? Well, basically, the computational heavy uh, training training phase, of course, on your GPU in the lab. After that, we put it to the microcontroller on the vehicle. It's you know, it's 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 okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think for competition, so, uh, even uh, controls are even more complicated sometimes. <laughs> you know, some some of algorithms we used. Yeah. That's right. You had a thought. Uh, I think when it comes to especially autonomous system, especially robot, I think the most heavy part is the processing the measurement, right? Especially for the environment perception part. And uh, so we 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 have we have a problem. Always have a problem that uh, this, uh, for example, seventy-five dollars uh, uh, core rotors, and uh, I think recently we're more like uh, to try to employ the idea of AGI to employ additional neural stick to just for just for the processing of the for example for the images for the environmental processing part. I think a uh, competition uh, burden, more a like decomposition of this uh, competition burden is definitely uh, perhaps one of the keys to to solve this uh, capability, competition capability thing. Great. Um, there's a question about uh, cybersecurity. So we've been talking about safety and, you know, essentially sort of ensuring that things work, you know, even in no normal situations is a difficult thing, right? Essentially that the robots do what they're supposed to do. But if you were to throw in adversaries that are uh, maliciously trying to inject uh, attacks and so forth, um, what, are the, what are your perspectives on how things have to change? Um, what's, what, what, what is different for, from, about security from, say, standard robustness techniques or fault tolerance? So you have to deal with a real-time malicious attack. So that means you have to have a real-time monitoring of the whole system. So if the system is faulty, you have to have a way to compare it with, uh, say, correct or un, I mean, intact signals. So that's why you still need to have some redundancy there. Uh, if you want to retrofit a system. And on the other, other hand, we did try some learning algorithm too, on top of a classical like stabilizing control, for example. And then we have some learning, additional learning module to deal with, of, let's say to try to deal with the uh, attacks so that you can add additional torques or controls on top of that conventional stabilizing controller to deal with um, disturbances, that type of thing. Um, that's what we did. And there's a, I believe we had a ECRAW IROS paper on that too. It's just a initial results for now. You know, another point um, that we should, I, I feel like I'm answering questions with more questions, but if, you, if you're using a learning algorithm in your feedback loop, like we're using for perception, um, and your enemy knows that you're using a learning algorithm and they probably can guess what type of learning algorithm you're using, it can becomes like very easy for them to figure out how to spoof it by giving exactly the right images which look to the human eye like they're correct and can mess the system up. So that is also a quite a, you know, a challenging issue yeah. when you're using learning and somebody learns the learning algorithm that you're using. 
Yeah, I think there's a community work on the adversarial uh, AI. Yeah, yeah, so basically you can fool the AI. I mean, even you can, I think we had uh, some interest in this area a couple of years ago too. So you can use some, some similar morphology, similar to a bird, a robot bird, a real bird or something. You can fool, you can easily fool the AI algorithm. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. It's like a sword and the, you know, the, the, the fence. Yeah. yeah. And I think in the context of multi-agent systems, Shashui, uh, do you have any thoughts on security and the additional challenges that multiple robots working together introduce into the, when you consider security? Yes, actually it's, a, it's, a, it's a, our recent work more like, uh, uh, I think we, we, we consider the worst scenario, we consider it more like intelligent uh, attacker which can pretend to be a good one, but send the wrong information. And uh, we also, I think we more like a, uh, proposed a, perhaps a very conservative uh, technique and uh, which can uh, guarantee us to achieve uh, resilience, at least for consensus-based algorithm. But we, the, 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 the cost is, the, is a little bit uh, network redundancy and information redundancy, but we don't have to identify which one is the attacker. I mean, we use all the information we received, but uh, uh, but the algorithm will 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 automatically filter the wrong information, the impact of the wrong information. And uh, I think when it comes to multi, the cyber attacks for multi agent system, it, it become seems become hard. I think uh, especially when we consider implementation, each robot here is uh, with a limited capability of processing. And also with the limited uh, uh, information, especially with limited inf uh, global information, and each robot can only coordinate with a certain nearby uh, neighbors. So it, I would say it's become more and more challenging. Absolutely. Um, the uh, some other questions pertain to uh, uh, this this trade off again between safety and um, and learning. Uh, there was one question that came back to this idea of um, how do we balance off between these two? And, and the question pertains to, is there a way, is there a notion of safety and aggression, let's say, that could be introduced into these learning algorithms to allow them to selectively trade off? Or perhaps like Professor Tomlin, uh, I think you answered in uh, response to the question about conservative uh, assumptions about the disturbances. If you know you're in sort of a safe region, you could perhaps relax that assumption and you know, and, and perhaps explore a little bit more. Whereas if you're close to the boundary, maybe you have to be more, more careful. Um, so is there some sort of a notion that could be introduced that allows us to dynamically trade off between these two things in a, in a, in a learning algorithm as opposed to, you know, focusing on a hard notion of safe versus exploration? I think that yes, um, there is in, but I, I, I'm not sure how to think about it in general. I, I, I mean, one thing to say is that if you are further away from a safety boundary, you can afford to be more aggressive. However, systems are typically designed such that um, the safety and performance boundaries are kind of butting up against each other. So if you're gonna be more aggressive, that's automatically taking you to the boundary of a safety controller, right? Because it means in vehicles, you're gonna go at a higher velocity, you're gonna, which, you know, whether it's your own vehicle or whether you're um, looking at vehicles around you, that becomes a more unsafe condition typically. So, um, so you know, often, often the high performance or the more aggressive maneuver is directly butting up against safety. And I think there is a trade-off and maybe the development of computational tools which allow you to explore this trade-off and weight it is, um, it, it's a useful tool to have. Um, and that, that's what we have been using these level set methods for. Um, in fact, even now we're working on a problem um, really not related to learning, just um, switching between the, well, we could use it in learning, but switching between the performance-based control and the safety-based control. And uh, how to do that in a way that you, um, you're blending both of them yet still maintaining safety. Perfect. 
Um, so I think I'd like to end off here. We just have a couple minutes with uh, just circling back around to the human side of things, which we haven't discussed uh, as much here, but uh, again, was a feature of, of Professor Talman's talk. Um, and so of course, this idea that robots are interacting with humans and that's a fundamental uh, characteristic of robots and that they're gonna increase. Um, and there's sort of perception as reality, right? So I think coming back to this idea of performance versus safety envelopes, an optimally performing robot that skirts uh, the, the safety boundary may still be perceived to be risky or uh, you know, not well performing by the humans that are trying to control those. Um, and so you know, then that might lead the humans to not use those, I think, as Insuk mentioned in, 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 in his slides. So um, how do we start thinking about designing not only for safety, but also for the perceptions of the humans that use those robots? Is there other tools and techniques that currently exist to think about those things? Um, or is that an area for, for significant future work? In one, just as a, a side note to that, in one project, we had um, a bunch of human subjects um, study uh, the reachable, like the, the problem of vehicles moving close to each other and assess whether they thought this was a safe initial condition or not. And then we tiled the space and compared it with a reachability computation. And humans were in general more conservative than, as you say, than the optimal control is. Optimal control just skirts corners and loves to do things right at the edge. So um, yes, I think the work, for example, that Xiao Shui presented in, in terms of uh, thinking about how um, people like incorporating uh, human input into the system, not only for human assisted safety, but also for um, the, uh, the uh, incorporation of perceptions of, of what is safe and not is very important. Yes, regarding for the human the input, I think beside the, uh, uh, the slide that present, we more like uh, integrate the human the sparse input into robots planning. We also uh, have recently developed a, a method based on inverse optimal control to analyze the human motions. The, more, the, the basic assumption that uh, assume human, all human motions are optimal uh, or nearly optimal. And uh, we want to uh, use uh, observations of humans' uh, gestures for the human motion analysis. And uh, the method is uh, by simulation and also real human motion data. And it match, uh, our algorithm matches uh, this, uh, this real human data. I think it's uh, very well, it's 99% of the data points. Uh, very well, and it, it more like it turns out to be, I would say, it's uh, how to utilize control theory and uh, especially inverse of control to analyze the motion for machine to understand what uh, uh, the w the human motion segmentation or and also predict what is the human next motion is also a key problem for the human machine interaction. But of course. This is based on human motion are optimal or nearly optimal exception. Great. Um, so I think we're at the five o'clock mark here. So that was a lovely panel, a lot of food for thought. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully the audience also had many other questions answered. Uh, clearly, this is a rich area for future exploration. Uh, more questions and answers is always a good thing, especially for all the graduate students that are, that are attending. Um, and so I'd like to thank the panel again, uh, Professor Talman. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, lecture and panel and visit today. Uh, Shinyan Deng, Professor Shinyan Deng, Professor Insek Wong, and Professor Shashui Mo. And Dimitri, if you'd like to say final words. Well, Sreyas, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you as well. And I would also like to thank all of the distinguished panelists. So thank you so much for, um, you know, uh, giving us your thoughts and ideas here. And uh, thank you everybody who attended this. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and we really enjoyed uh, your visit, Professor Tomlin. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting me. It's been a pleasure to join you in these discussions. Um, and thank you for such a thoughtful organization of a panel and also the discussions. Very much appreciated you coming here. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you very much.